Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are joining us from today. I'm Virla Nawant, Senior Research Fellow for Asia Studies and Head of the Indo-Pacific Program at RUSI. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to the third webinar in a series of four on Indo-Pacific security. I can think of no more timely topic uh, to discuss today than the 20th Party Congress, which was just held in Beijing and which saw the reinstatement of Xi Jinping as the core leader of China for an unprecedented third term. A great deal has already been written over the past week with experts and policymakers alike, of course, seeking to parse through and find meaning in everything from the CCP work report to Xi Jinping's speech, new personnel appointments, and of course, the extraordinary sight of the removal of former President Hu Jintao from the proceedings once foreign journalists were allowed in. We'll be exploring all of that today and more, and I can think of no better person to help us understand these developments than Professor Rana Mitter. Professor Mitter is the director of the University of Oxford China Center, where he is professor of the history of politics, history and politics, I should say, of modern China. Professor Mitter studies the emergence of nationalism in modern China, both in the early 20th century and in the contemporary era and specializes in contemporary Chinese politics, Chinese history, as well as Cold War and post-Cold War politics, history, and culture, particularly in Asia. He is the author of several award-winning books, including, I should say, his book, uh, China's War with Japan, 1937-45, The Struggle for Survival, which in the US was under the title of Forgotten Ally, uh, which was named uh, in 2013 as the book of the year in the Financial Times and The Economist, and won Rusi's Duke of Westminster Medal for Military Literature. Professor Mitter will first deliver some opening remarks and we'll engage in a bit of a conversation around some of the key issues that we think occurred uh, over the past week, after which we will open the floor for Q&A for the remainder of the hour. But I should say, um, please do submit all your questions um, throughout our conversation and throughout his opening remarks um, via the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That means that we'll be able to get to them uh, as soon as possible and as many as possible uh, within the next hour or so. Please note that this event is on the record. It's being live streamed on a number of different platforms, uh, including Rusi's website, and will be recorded for those of you who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Rana, thank you so much for joining us and giving us some of your time. Uh, and the floor is yours. Vera, thanks very much indeed for that very generous introduction. Um, hello at all time zones to everyone. I'm actually myself in Boston, Massachusetts at the moment, so I'm getting a lovely view of the dawn coming up over the, the cityscape uh, here. Um, just one uh, correction, if, if, if I may. Um, I directed the University of Oxford China Centre for seven very happy years. It's now been handed over to my brilliant colleague, who I think Rusi knows very well, Professor Todd Hall, Professor of International Relations at Oxford, and uh, he is uh, taking it in, in great new directions. Um, so I thought that what I would do is to perhaps spend the first five to seven minutes just going over a few things that struck me in terms of uh, the Congress, uh, starting with Xi's big speech uh, just over a week ago now, of course, um, and then some of the proceedings and then ending up where we saw the new lineup of the Standing Committee uh, Politburo. Um, I'm going to give you a few things, many of which I think probably are in line with what a lot of interpretations have said. And one that I think um, is slightly different from what I've been seeing in a lot of the news. So I'll give you both of those and see what everyone thinks. When I've done a, a, a few lines along that, um, along uh, uh, along those topics, um, Virla's going to come back in and we're going to have a bit of a conversation for 15 minutes or so in which uh, I will probably learn as much from Virla, if not more, than uh, she will from anything I, I say. And then I know we got a, we've got got and I'm sure with this audience, we're going to have plenty of people who want to ask about what is happening and what may, may happen next. So let me start with a few reasonably clearly drawn highlights that I think we can uh, put down as being pretty solid. I'm going to start at the end with the lineup, uh, the seven men 
and perhaps one of the least surprising things uh, in the history of Chinese politics, yet again, it is seven men in black suits um, turning up uh, to mark the direction of political travel for China, um, with, of course, as I think will have been widely noted now, even the one uh, woman who was usually included at the wider um, Politburo uh, Central Committee level also no longer replaced. It's an entirely male body at the, at the top end. So what does that lineup mean? Well, as a lot of people I think have been observing, but I think it's really worth stressing, Li Tiang as premier indicates a direction of travel in which to use, if I may revive a phrase from Chairman Mao's glory days back in the 1950s, politics is in command. In other words, there was a lot of speculation, and I'll be honest with you because we're on the record and uh, you know we should all own up to my mistakes. I was one of those people who had been saying that, you know, we might see Wang Yang, who had been uh, on the standing committee for quite some time, big market reformer, perhaps kept on promoted, maybe becoming the premier. That might have said something about the direction of travel for business, both domestic and international in terms of marketization. But no, he's been asked to to retire. Uh, Hu Chunhua, perhaps one of the biggest names coming up through a faction that is not Xi Jinping's grouping, the China Youth League, very much associated with former president Hu Jintao, and I'll get back to him in a moment, um, not promoted to the, the top seven. Uh, so despite his growing um, both domestic and before pandemic international standing, um, someone considered a bit of a rising star, uh, not at least for the moment put in the, the top layers of that firmament. Instead, a figure put in who has shown real loyalty, even in the face of tremendous criticism, even in China's very, very restricted propaganda atmosphere, loyalty towards Xi Jinping. You will recall that Li Qiang was Shanghai party chief during the seven week lockdown earlier this year, which got even many very loyal, loyal people, very, um, you know, Xi friendly people amongst the wider middle class pretty angry because uh, essentially their lives were destroyed, their businesses were destroyed, they had no idea when it was going to come to an end. And Li Qiang stuck to the zero COVID policy with pretty much no deviation. Many people thought that would damage him politically. In fact, it has taken him to the very highest levels. If you look at the other people, Ding Xiaoxiang, Li Xi and the others, um, you know, pretty much all of them, every one of them actually, you can see some sort of connection to the rise to power of Xi Jinping at various of the stages uh, his time in Fujian, his time in uh, Zhejiang, and so forth. So, in that con in that context, um, we can see that the rise to power of people who believe that ideological precepts and that creating a vision of China that is essentially in accord with what has been laid down by Xi Jinping is going to be the direction of travel. That means, for instance, as was made very clear, no zero COVID. Um, relief in the near future. Taking a bet, I mean, you know, all of us, I think, who are interested in, you know, getting back into, into finding out what goes on in China, meeting our academic colleagues and others there um, are keen to do that. But I think 2023 looks less and less likely now. It may even be beyond that. And I know that our Chinese colleagues, while they can come outside China, will, of course, are reluctant to do so because they'll be stuck back in quarantine when they go back in. So it's creating, in the wider sense of things, a real problem in terms of information networks, information gathering, being able to swap the latest information, whether it's on you know, life sciences, COVID vaccines or history a subject in which I have great interest. Uh, I very much miss seeing my historical colleagues in China. They like to say they miss us. And I hope that, you know, that's a, a circuit which returns. But right now, we're not going back to the isolation of the days of Mao, but we are in a more isolated China for the next five years. And as I wrote, actually, you can find it free online on, on the Guardian website, a piece just uh, yesterday, published a piece yesterday, in which I point out that there's an interesting development, one that's very, you know, Rusi oriented in some ways, which is the development of a very strong sense of China being very present in the virtual world, but becoming much less present in the physical world beyond China itself. And that's a quite anomalous situation we haven't seen before, but which I think actually you can take not just as a product of COVID, but as a political symbol, as a political gesture, a political template for what the next five years is going to look like. We're gonna see a lot more online China, but maybe we will see less of actual China in the, in the world. And, and that is a shift, I think. For me, also one of the most interesting things in the speech that she made way back uh, a week ago now, uh, wasn't that much commented on, but I think actually it was one of the more interesting things, says something about confidence, but also the unwillingness to accept any alternative viewpoints at the top 
level of the party. And that was the section about rooting out opposition. Now you'll have seen that even shortly before the Congress, some very high level Chinese officials were basically arrested, sentenced, uh, Fu Zhenghua, that's been one of the most obvious ones, just uh, just a few days ahead of the, uh, of the Congress, if I remember correctly. Uh, why does this matter? Because I think one of the things that the party has managed to do successfully in the last 10 years in its own terms, this may not be your definition of success, but I think it's the party's, is to create a very strong narrative in the minds of many in the middle classes and in the kind of wider public in China, that anti-corruption is the kind of brand name value associated with the party and with Xi Jinping. My favorite example, which comes from a few years ago, but indulge me for a moment, uh, was back in 2017, at the time of the 19th Party Congress, when China, when China's authorities, uh, propaganda authorities, felt confident enough to sponsor and pay for and have broadcast on national TV to a massive audience, a series called uh, um, Yi, uh, In the Name of the People. If you haven't seen it, do watch it. It's online on YouTube for free, English subtitles. You don't need to know Chinese to watch it. It's about, it's basically for British um, uh, uh, participants in this uh uh, um, uh, sem online seminar, uh, it's a like line of duty. It's about anti-corruption officials who basically take down corrupt officials in the countryside. And the fact that the party felt confident enough to actually show this on TV, yes, we know there's corruption, but yes, we're dealing with it, suggests that they feel that they're on top of this particular issue. And she mentioning that uh, rather than trying to cover it over, I think was rather indicative of the, uh, the comfort level that he feels on that particular issue. Two other quick things. Um, the, the, the next one you'll be unsurprised to hear is Taiwan, which I'm sure we're going to talk more about in our discussion um, anyway. Um, I mean, it's notable that the language that was used by Xi Jinping in his speech was uh, robust, to put it mildly, not actually, at least in terms of the specific language, very different from what we've heard before. Peaceful means preferred, but if you don't have that, then um, you know we reserve the right to use force, et cetera, et cetera. But by now, of course, we're in a situation where the words, parsing the words themselves, is not enough. We do have to look at the actual tensions rising in the region and what might happen around the. So that situation continues to be very tense and was certainly not eased by the words heard in the uh, in the speech. And um, beyond that, I think it's interesting to say that uh, on the economy, there was almost not that much said the, the the dual circulation idea which has been going around for a while and the idea of common prosperity in other words greater egalitarianism those are the two poles around which the speech was made but it didn't actually deal with practical problems how do you reinvigorate the economy when you continue with zero covid which has basically done a huge amount to damp dampen consumer uh, demand domestically how do you actually run a dual circulation policy which involves being a massive global exporter and raising domestic consumption and controlling your capital account at home, the sort of triad of uh, which most economists sort of scratch their heads at, um, wasn't solved in the speech or anything around it. But then of course, these are political statements, perhaps even more than they are um, economic uh, statements. And the question of investing for the future, how do you build a talent pipeline uh, when uh, entrepreneurs, can't get in and out of the country easily. Their global talent is very mobile. Right now, it's not easy for it to be mobile in and out of China. And beyond that, no mention of ideas that might be in the next five years, such as the deeper incorporate, well, not no mention, but any limited mention of the incorporation of Hong Kong into the greater Bay Area as a deep pool of capital, for instance, to fuel the um, tech ecology, which is burgeoning just across the border in Shenzhen, and has, of course, both military and civilian applications. And of course, the interaction, the symbiosis between the two is one of the areas where China can definitely push ahead with its advantages. But to do so, it has to do so in the context of an economy that's being reinvigorated. So right, right now, the signals are somewhat mixed, to, uh, to put it mildly. But the intention to continue its drive to become essentially a leader in key technologies is absolutely there. Let me finish with the one thing that I think didn't happen, but more than happy to take discussion on this uh, during the, the seminar. There's been some reporting that the, rep the removal of former President Hu Jintao from the, uh, the Great Hall of the People was a sort of final deliberate calculated snub to the previous leadership, that it was a sort of drive-by kidnapping or, or almost. Um, I don't think that this seems to me quite what um, is convincing for the following reason. If the party was wanting to make some kind of very public gesture, I assume they would have shown it on domestic television and made a big deal of it, whereas it was pretty much scrubbed immediately afterwards. And 
it seems more likely that something unexpected happened around the health of you know an elderly former leader foreign press were already in the room and so couldn't be stopped from broadcasting it and indeed did but every single possibility of anyone domestically seeing it seemed to have been worked on by the censors within a few you know hours certainly maybe even minutes of it taking place so my sense is that in this case it may just be what it says on the tin that the former leader was not feeling very well didn't want to leave because you know it's a big event but was being monitored and persuaded that look really you you don't want to um uh, be the center of attention uh in the middle of this very important moment for the, the congress and my guess is it's probably in that case nothing more than that but as i say very happy to hear other interpretations particularly from anyone who actually knows what's what's going on so i think plenty to digest there uh Brilla. um it would be great if uh, you and i were in conversation and we could open up that conversation to our large and distinguished group here online today wonderful thank you so much uh rana and there's a lot of food for thought there for sure um to our audience, please do keep submitting questions um, as we have a chat now, but um, maybe just something that you touched on in terms of the economy. The economy is so incredibly important for the CCP as a source of legitimacy, of course, um, as the only party that can really drive the economy forward. And yet we have seen a slowing economic growth for a few years now. We've seen, um, of course, the target uh, for GDP this year um, already be changed from a hard target to uh, more of a guidance. Um, we saw economic data be, be delayed and in, in actually being issued and publicized. Uh, and it seems that has now come, come out um, and shown uh, a remarkably actually um, growth, uh, growth figure, which had not been anticipated and had not been predicted by foreign observers. I mean, what do you think this says about um, you know, the narrative of the CCP internally? Is that a convincing one still? Um, so I think we have to separate Virla the the particular and the the general, and they they point in perhaps somewhat different directions. In the short term, it is clear that there has been a real dent to the economy. Um, I mean, clearly, the inability, particularly of um, what would you call it, um, small and medium enterprises, the SMEs, you know, which have. Um, uh traditionally been at the heart of the private enterprise uh revolution that has been you know roaring away one way or another since the since the 19 uh, 1980s but having said that there is also a lot of long term change that has the potential to produce growth and you're right that you know within just the last few hours it was said that the third quarter figures are slightly or well, significantly higher a bit of a bounce compared to what they might have expected to have been and compared to a year previous so i think by the way we'll continue to have variants up and down in the in the figures and i don't think anyone in the party or elsewhere should you know sit back and say relax and say this is this is going to be fine but i think that overall you can see the areas where the potential for sustainable growth is there but it's dependent on a variety of changes that haven't yet been properly um, implemented. So I'll go back to the comments that I made briefly in the opening uh, statement about um, investment in technology uh, and research and development, other areas where you get higher value added jobs. Now, China has fairly consistently put about 2.4% of GDP uh, across the public and private sectors into research and development, broadly speaking. And, you know, anyone can see the results. China has an extraordinary range of tech majors in terms of its private sector. It also has, of course, the capacity to generate huge amounts of data, much of which, of course, is used then for state purposes, which are not monitored by 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 anyone else. But this is clearly a sophisticated um, uh, ecology in which the public private sectors work together under party direction. And there's no reason in economic terms why that shouldn't continue to produce large numbers of jobs. However, we're seeing that there is a problem, first of all, in terms of opportunities being created for employment amongst many of that younger generation who are graduating now. Youth unemployment is a particular problem. That's one of the reasons I mentioned Hu Chunhua, who didn't make it to the top seven. But, you know, youth unemployment has been one of the issues that he's talked about uh, in uh, uh, in great um, uh, uh, in great depth. Um, why is this important to mention? Because China has still at the moment a very unevenly distributed um, um, uh, spread of, of, of talent and investment. If you take just South China and the areas that border Hong Kong, but actually kind of well beyond that, the the, um, uh, uh, the Bay Area, 
You have a per capita GDP there of something like 23,000 US dollars a year, which is comparable to parts of Southern Europe. It also has huge amounts of investment going on there. We're talking about um, investment, for instance, in batteries for electric vehicles, which are cl clearly going to be at the um, cutting edge of the next generation of technological development. Then contrast that with places out in the interior, you know, Qinghai, the West, and so forth, where actually not only is the um, economic, other kind of day to day economic figures per capita, GDP very bad, but also the talent pipeline, if you want to use that phrase, the development of human capital is in a horrible state uh, because being, you know, children who are there in the countryside are being educated essentially by teachers who don't make the grade. The reason being that lots of well-educated um, uh, young graduates in the big cities can't find enough work there. And theoretically, they could go out to work in the countryside as teachers. But the prospect, A, of living in those conditions and B, of losing their hukou, the famous Chinese internal you know, uh, uh, residence permit system, you can go to the countryside, but you can probably can't come back again afterwards. All of these are essentially hindering mobility in a big way, combined with the other issues, which include um, you know, expensive mortgages, the inability to uh, uh, be able to provide sufficient welfare and health care in a partly privatized, um, not very well supported uh, system. All of these are inhibiting the long term growth that China needs to be able to get from middle income to high income society. So a little bounce in the figures doesn't strike me as surprising on the grounds there needs to be, you know, it's gonna be some comeback uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the currently very dire state of the economy. But there's long-term issues combined with the one other one we haven't mentioned, let me throw it in now, demographic change. In other words, the realization which has now come certain to the top authorities in China, the statistics look really terrible, but Essentially, if things just go in a straight line, then you know by the end of the century we're going to have more people on retirement than there are people actually of of, of working uh, working age. All of these point to the really long term problems that so far the Party Congress has not pointed the way towards solving. We did not see, I think, there a blueprint or a plan to deal with those long term economic issues that really still need to be addressed. That's absolutely. Um... Fascinating, Rana. I mean, in terms of we've got some questions coming in on the economy more generally, um, you know, implications of the housing meltdown with apparent, move, apparent movement of people um, refusing to pay uh, their mortgages, of course, or unable to pay their mortgages, um, housing going bust, uh, that, that bubble bursting, and then more generally, you know, the global economy and how that's going to impact um, China. The fact that um, you know there is a predicted uh, global recession um, on the horizon does this all kind of spell doom and gloom for the Chinese economy? Well, gloom and doom is 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 real but relative. It's worth noting that at least in most combinations we can imagine, China is huge enough or its population is huge enough that domestic economic activity will be enough to keep it chugging along for quite a while. It's not, you know, I think I think the predictions that you get in a few places of the sudden imminent collapse of China through, you know, a property flash crash or a banking crisis are overblown uh, on those particular issues, by the way. I think that we're beginning to see the pattern of what's happening, which is basically, let's take the property market, uh, big private sector companies that extended themselves too much in the good times, you know, Evergrande, uh, Fantasia, I think, and others, um, are basically being bailed out by the government, but the government doesn't want to say that they're bailing them out. So they get another large private sector actor. They, they you know, basically put money behind the bar, so to speak, and tell another private sector actor to come in and sort them out. And then basically domestic mortgage buyers get their apartments, but international investors in those companies are back of the line in terms of getting their investment back. I mean, to some extent, you can't weep too hard about that because you know any international investor who has been thinking of China, China's property as a safe bet for some time may have been, I think, um, overly optimistic is the most polite way I could uh, put it. And they're certainly not overly optimistic now. But I do not think the Chinese government is going to let large numbers of aspirant middle class apartment holders, people who have paid part of the mortgage in advance um, and want to get their apartments, get their flats, uh, going to let them be on the on the street. So I think in the short term, those problems will be solved. What it does is to pilot is to is to is to exacerbate um, even worse the problem that China has been dealing with now for the last what, over 10 years, which is slowly but surely letting down huge amounts of debt. And in particular, I mean, let me point to one particular example that I think is very in interesting and indicative of what's 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 happening. Lots of costs of the COVID lockdown have been put on local governments, 
And local governments are trying to find subtle or not so subtle ways to push back. So, for instance, those who have been in China or you know, been talking to people in China will know that PCR tests are now part of you know everyday life, essentially. And they continue to be pretty expensive. And the cost of those have been put on local governments who don't have any money and basically sort of still have huge amounts of debt. So local governments are now beginning to start to charge people in some places for these tests. And since they're compulsory for everyday life, this is creating a social tension. And what the local governments are really doing is sort of signaling to Beijing, you keep putting these you know, endless unfunded mandates on us and we have huge amounts of debt and we don't have the money. And if you don't watch out, then basically this debt is going to implode. Um, so... All of those things are really where the difficulty lies. I don't underestimate the capacity of, of China's banking system to be able to sort of you know, come up with cash to sort of staunch any sudden uh, localized collapse. But at the same time, all of that then continues to uh, fuel the problem that China cannot infinitely, like any more than any other country, kind of infinitely spend on an infinite number of projects. And it's worth noting in a rather different context, for instance, the Belt and Road Initiative, perhaps the single most notable flagship brand name, if you want to call it that, um, that China has had uh, over the last 10 years, has both changed its emphasis. There's much more talk now, of course, about the Global Security Initiative, but also in terms of the money side of things, really kind of quietly and discreetly at the end of 2021, started saying, we're not going to give you give these large loans with very untransparent background or conditions to basically build railways in the middle of, of nowhere. The, it's now the private sector, Chinese private sector, that's expected to step up. And of course, the private sector has shareholders. It has uh, demands on return, both short term as well as medium term. Of course, it's influenced by the party state, as everything is in China. That, that goes you know, without saying. But all the same, as we've seen from the property sector, Chinese private sector companies cannot invest in projects just because the state thinks that they're a kind of grandiose um, way of, of flaunting its, its power. They actually need some returns. And that is another area in which essentially the seemingly unstoppable flow of Chinese cash, whether domestically or internationally, has not been a reality for, for quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we saw this already a few years ago as well, where you had a list where um, the government was effectively saying, these are areas where you can invest in and should invest in abroad. And these are areas which are very unproductive and actually unhelpful uh, in terms of returns. And so managing that spending and that outward flow of capital uh, is something we've already seen happening yeah. behind the scenes. It, it turned um, out buying, it, buying, buying, buying Disneyland wasn't a good idea or whatever. No, right, exactly. Really so right. and I think also more generally, just, you know, looking at how COVID impacts the Chinese economy indirectly is a really key one too. So to what extent is China actually going to get returns on some of these investments that it's made abroad uh, in countries that are going through their own economic um, woes given COVID? I mean, this is a big problem for China too. How are they going to get some of this money back? So I think when we talk about the Belt and Road, having some of that nuance is particularly key. Um, but when we talk about budgets and GDP spending, how do you see the proportion of spending on, say, some of these economic issues versus military? There's a lot of questions coming in around Chinese military modernization, around professionalization. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion around the military budget uh, as a proportion of GDP over the years. I mean, what, what's, what does the trajectory look like? How do you see that reflected as well? Not in GDP terms necessarily, but more generally in emphasis of the PLA in, in the work report and in Xi Jinping's comments so far. Sure. Um, well, I think there'll be plenty of people actually on this call who are more expert than me on this. So I'd be very happy to call, but not least you, I think, Verella. So we should bring that in. But let me let me give a couple of quick, uh, quick, quick thoughts. I mean, first of all, I think it's fair to say that trying to find a clear line of delineation between uh, military oriented uh, spending and civilian spending in some areas is not so easy to do. Um, that could be something as simple as personnel, you know, the fact that um, internal security, or at least significant parts of it, counts as part of a military budget also. But also beyond that, if one thinks about the fact that a large part of the, uh, and by the way, the, 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 it's clear that the numbers being put forward suggest significant increases, at least in uh, real terms, on uh, uh, the Chinese budget for the military. Um, but beyond that, if you think about sectors like, um, you know, pretty much all sorts of, of, of technology, it's very clear that investment there can both serve an extremely important civilian commercial purpose and military purposes. So, you know, if you think about, 
um, uh, kind of virtual retail environments in China, which are now immensely sophisticated, uh, quite a lot of competition in that market, some of which is actually being pushed very hard by the antitrust authorities in China who are pushing hard on some of the, the big names, Tencent, Alibaba and others, to try and let smaller actors into the market and create competition. I mean, that's very much about the domestic consumer market. And yet, of course, the technology is being used, including, you know, big capacity to gather data, to be able to process very large amounts of data and kind of refract it back, are also immensely useful for a whole variety of security purposes, both domestically and in terms of international projection. So in all of those areas, I think it's important to just look at the entire ecology and understand that actually the, a clear differentiation that this is what the military does and this is what the civilian sector does isn't, I think, uh, sufficient explanation. Thank you, um, Rana. I mean, in terms of then, you know, we've seen this uh, confidence that you mentioned um, uh, coming out of the the uh, the party congress. Um, Xi Jinping obviously in a very powerful position. Um, I mean. Does this at the same time um, mean that uh, all foreign and, and military decision making lies in his hands? Or do you think that there will be um, more of a, a, you know, an evolution of sorts in terms of decision making? Or does it mean that the people that he's spoken uh, about and that he has um, chosen have actually um, pretty much been selected because of the fact that they will more than likely not not uh, you know, pose any opposition to him. And then maybe let's talk a little bit about Taiwan as well, and more generally regional security and what implications this has. Sure. Um, we know, in a general sense, as much as we know anything about the internal workings of Chinese government, that the PLA and the military more generally have been, you know, thoroughly uh, revised and reoriented in the 10 years of Xi Jinping's rule, and that he has much greater control over a whole variety of strands within that particular um, ecology. Uh, we also know that, you know, in a broad sense, uh, clearly it's the job of the military to give what they would think of as realistic assessments of what China can and what China can't do in the region and beyond. What we don't know is how far the continuing concentration of, or I should say what I don't know, perhaps there are other people who do, do know what I don't know, is how much the continuing concentration of um, political loyalty as the characteristic which enables promotion means that information gathering and information, um, uh, how can one put it, sort of filtering in the military and other related, and indeed in any other area gets through to the top leadership. I think there's a difference here in a broad sense between how this works with the military and how it works with the economy, because in a sense, the feedback loop on economics is there. You know, you have statistics, you have the evidence of one's own eyes that, you know, small businesses aren't doing well or whatever it, it, it might be. And the feedback loop tends to be fairly quick. So even though, as we're seeing at the moment, you can have a scenario where in which you say that certain economic outcomes don't matter because political outcomes are more important. Nonetheless, the evidence that the economic outcomes are suboptimal and real is visible. That's much more difficult in the military sphere, where, as has been frequently observed by China itself, China hasn't actually you know, been in any kind of significant conflict since 1979. And while it has plenty of experience in uh, peacekeeping and other operations, that's not really in quite the same, uh, same zone. So the sense in which any of the capacity of what they can do is obviously being poured over in great detail by institutions like Rusi and a whole variety of actors in the West. But one senses it's also being, you know, thought through in immense detail within China itself, although not in a very transparent way. And as with all these projections, a projection is very useful, but it is just a projection. And how far those can be discussed in a kind of wide spectrum of what's possible and what isn't with, you know, the Politburo, the top uh, top seven leadership. I think it's still not entirely uh, not entirely clear. Certainly, we do know that two of the people who probably would have been strongest in pushing back against the economic direction of travel in the top seven have just left, uh, Li Keqiang and uh, Wang Yang. Uh, 
So if that's the case, then maybe you can, you know, by cognate example, suggest that that'd be the case for the military as well. But I have to say that, um, you know, there will be others who definitely know more about it than, uh, than I do, no question about that. But nonetheless, this is not an area where I think great transparency seems ever to be um, to be available. We are we are slightly sort of extrapolating from what we know in a, in a, a, a rather broad way. Um, and do you want to sort of discuss the, the, the kind of region as well, Vera, is that right? Uh, what, what? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What are the kind of regional implications, I suppose? But maybe maybe I'll just jump in there just on one thing. I think in sure. terms of the military um, appointments that we've seen so far, I believe mm. four uh, PLA generals are now, um, you know, from the ground forces are, are in the CMC. Um, so it's interesting if we think about, you know, regional um, security, um, Chinese military capabilities, issues that they are, are worried about, such as um, joint operations. It's interesting that you have generals in, in such um, prominent positions. You don't really have um, the same Air Force or PLA Navy um, representation, which is interesting. Um, I believe there's also um, two vice chairs who uh, have a focus on jointness, though. Um, one more Eastern theater, Taiwan, and one uh, more on Sino uh, kind of Vietnam uh, experiences. So um, I think it's a bit of a, a mixed bag in that sense. Um, but, you know, something that I think um, over the next few uh, weeks and months, if not year, everyone will be looking at closely to see what this really means in terms of capabilities, in terms of leadership in the military. And again, what that then means in terms of transferring that into capability uh, in specific scenarios as well. Yep. Uh, do, do you have a thought about the particular promotion of General Jiang Youxia um, at the age of 70, 72? Is this yes, I'm, it's significant? interesting. Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, no, it's a question to you, actually, Verla. Do, do yeah, you... no, sure. It's, I mean, it's interesting that he, of course, has um, experience in the, the Sino-Vietnam War. Um, so maybe there's a bit of kind of um, you know, some of that experience might be uh, useful and seen as a, a learning moment um, for the PRC in, in that respect. and. He has, of course, ties with, um, I believe, Xi Jinping and his father in that respect. So um, a bit of a, a I think, a, a connection on, on multiple levels of uh, what his utility in that respect is. Um, but I'm sure that this, again, is something that everyone will be looking for meaning in uh, over, over the next few years, of course. Um, and of course, I think when we look at, say, the younger generation of, of PLA um, soldiers and, and officers, and this is really... Um, something where perhaps he can contribute to as well. And certainly the um, promotion of Hoi Fong and other people who have, you know, Fujian experience, knowledge of right. essentially across the water of Taiwan and so forth, suggests an interest in, in, in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, yeah. How much of this is about information gathering and how much about political positioning, though, it still seems to be very, very unclear. Exactly. But maybe then in terms of, I guess, you know, um, the, the general mood, you said tensions, uh, across the, the Taiwan Strait were rising, we shouldn't necessarily just look at words um, and that that is not enough. Um, how do you see this playing out then over the next five years? I mean, are we going to see um, you know, more of what we saw during um, you know, the Pelosi visit or right after the Pelosi visit, I should say? Um, is that kind of tension going to be ratcheted up over the next five years? I think there will be more tension over the next five years. I think most, you know, that's not particularly controversial analysis from either side, I, I, I think. I think, though, the following things have yet to be fully threaded together. So let me put them both on the table at the first, uh, at, at the same time. And I think I mean this as much to, um, you know, Beijing as to, to anyone else. Um, on the one hand, it's clear that all the military signals that are being sent are that the Taiwan question has been raised, you know, greatly in terms of, of, of urgency. And that will clearly lead to um, counter responses. It's very clear that Taiwan's own population is much more aware now that there is a sort of danger which didn't exist perhaps five, ten years ago, the kind of old status quo, which uh, is one of those things that, as they as they say in France, I think that it, it, doesn't, uh, um, it doesn't make sense in theory, only in practice, but, uh, you know, it held for quite a while. But even the theory of it is now, I think, yeah, well, the practice practice of it is coming under pressure and the theory of a kind of unrecognized state that nonetheless stayed un, um, you know, un, uh, unassaulted uh, may not be uh, as clearly defined as it uh, as it was. But let me link for a moment back to, to where we started, um, Birla, which is uh, the economy. Now, it seems to me that if you had one thing, the choice of just one thing to choose, that could make a plus or minus difference in terms of the revitalization of the Chinese economy in the next five years, not 
essentially, I was going to say not assaulting, but even actually not even putting pressure on Taiwan, would be a really obvious one in terms of being able to improve the mainland's own economic situation for a whole variety of reasons. One is that, of course, it means that the you know continuing uh, deepening of economic relations between the two sides and the continued supply of, of chips, but also plenty of other um, valuable uh, supply chains as well would be much more assured at the moment most of the surveys show that um, a lot of Taiwan businesses are either pulling out of connections to the mainland or thinking about doing so and that may not help Taiwan but it certainly doesn't help uh, help China beyond that the whole you know Asia Pacific region now has China as its single major trading partner I think that the bet may be at least initially in China that because it's such an important trading partner China could undertake an action against Taiwan and other countries might disapprove briefly, but they wouldn't do very much about it. But I think actually it's clear that the international effects of it uh, involve the United States, Japan and other actors might manifest themselves first, not in um, military action, but in very, very severe sanctions as we've seen in Russia. And even though, again, that would clearly have very, very damaging effects on the global economy and make a bad recession worse, there's no doubt that in terms of China's economic plans, it would make things absolutely much more difficult to recover from. So essentially not, you know, using harsh language, but not actually going any further uh, and calming down the actual temperature when it comes to uh, uh, anything military related to Taiwan would actually be a very good way of boosting the economy, but whether the, for, for China, but whether or not those two things are actually put together in decision makers' minds, again, is just one of those things that's not very transparent at all. I've certainly rarely have ever heard speeches or public statements that link the two things, because clearly that would go in a direction of political travel that's not currently very amenable to Beijing. The question is whether behind the scenes that pet trade-off, that payoff, is actually discussed at all. Well, it is interesting because I think a few years ago, um, you know, there was, I uh, can't remember the date specifically, but there was um, a former military official who came out and said, you know, we shouldn't necessarily um, be too, uh, too bold on this or make a, a rash decision, so to speak, um, and, and really, um, I guess, destroy or, or, or uh, hamper everything that has been achieved so far. I think from the military angle, there's also a question around preparedness, around capability. Um, you know, is this something that, that they're going to just take a, an off the cuff decision on? And quite frankly, I think no, um, for both economic reasons, um, you know, this, I think looking at the Ukraine response, looking at how um, companies themselves, the private sector reacted um, to the war in Ukraine, I think that does, necessarily, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that China expects this uh, in any kind of Taiwan scenario, but one can imagine that it does present a new worst case scenario for China to at least keep in mind. And as you, as you have said, Rana, we don't know what Beijing necessarily is thinking in that respect. Um, but looking at Ukraine, I would imagine that they are looking extremely closely at what has happened and how, um, you know, the international community regionally and more broadly further afield will be reacting um, to any sort of scenario on Taiwan. And for that, one would hope that they're looking at a variety of different uh, different um, tools or, I guess, issues. I, that I'd hope so, but could, could, I, could I throw a thought in there, actually, Mary? Because Absolutely. Be with, with kind of context, that I, a change that I find interesting and possibly quite problematic. I have no doubt, I mean, I don't know the details clearly, but I have no doubt that Beijing, you know, using that as a proxy for the policymaking establishment in China, which has parts that are economic, parts that are military, parts that, you know, have to deal with geopolitics and culture and other issues more broadly, that they have a tremendous wealth of information at their disposal, not least because they're so well connected in the virtual world these days. And they have plenty of specialists who obviously speak beautiful English and wonderful Russian and, you know, great German and all, all the things that they yeah. need to know in terms of information gathering. But because of the move towards regression from the world, which is exacerbated by COVID, of course, you know, essentially closing the borders, but which actually still continues more and more to be the kind of intellectual direction of travel of, of policymakers, the idea that basically you can get it all done within China. I think this is beginning to create a policymaking problem. It has the appearance of it. It's sort of the, the inability to take information and put it in what you might call emotional context. In other words, um, what good diplomats do, actually what good military people do, and you know what, one of the reasons why actually a lot of militaries actually employ anthropologists, uh, and I don't think the Chinese have necessarily done that, perhaps they have, but the US, not always the most successful military in, in, in recent years, always, but you know, the idea that essentially 
information isn't enough. You need to know how to apply it in cultural context. That seems to have been stripped out very strongly from the Chinese decision making apparatus. And that's largely because the vast majority of people making decisions literally can't leave China, even if they want to very easily because of the, the, the COVID uh, uh, restriction and getting exit visas now become very, very difficult. And many of the you know thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of Chinese who do operate around the world in various forms, seem to be much less engaged with the outside world than they used to even a generation um, ago. Uh, you know, Chinese diplomats around the world seem to be less interested in actually kind of going out and engaging in conversations, partly because, of course, they're presumably, you know, worried about their own political standing, perhaps more than the actual information gathering. But the kind of real life, the three dimensionality of Chinese decision making, which for a while actually was immensely successful. It's not gone completely, but it's really be corroded in some important ways. And I think that that may at the end of it be both potentially the, the, the cause of something quite dangerous, but also in the end, actually just straightforwardly a reduction in the capacity of China to make decisions about its place in the world at a stage where it hasn't yet fully established itself. You know, the US makes mistakes all the time and has done for, for decades, but the US got itself established as the global hegemon a long time ago, and it has a lot of fat to burn on that front. China has never actually sort of developed, perhaps fat isn't the best metaphor to, to use, but you know, the kind of uh, capacity essentially to have fuel in the tank um, because it's come on the scene relatively recently and it's been much more tied up with its own domestic woes than it has really about creating that global role. So it's trying to create a lot from a very thin base at the moment. And I think the zero COVID policy is one of the things that's standing in the way of it actually succeeding. But beyond that, I think that ideological sense that actually being self-sufficient, not engaging too much with the world other than on China's own terms, which, of course, are powerful, but they're not all powerful. This, I think, is, is creating a sort of information dearth that's becoming more and more noticeable in various important ways. Which is, of course, deeply worrying um, when we then think about how they interpret um, signals that they are being sent uh, and whether or not they are interpreting that correctly. Uh, well, absolutely. It's one of the many reasons why when asked, um, I always stress that I think actually large numbers of Chinese students coming and studying in the liberal world is a really good idea. Of course, just as in China, we want to be extraordinarily careful about things that have you know particular national security and international security technology sensitivity. That's a very specific area which can be dealt with. But the idea, more broadly speaking, that we do not want lots of Chinese coming and learning economics, history, um, you know, broadly about uh, the, the wide range of science that doesn't necessarily have any great security implications in the context also of socialization of us doing what frankly we need to do a lot more of which is learning about what china is how it works and you know what what actually ordinary chinese think about their everyday lives but on the flip side of that also pushing back against what certainly chinese students privately tell me which is a sense from the authorities in china not that they're banned from studying overseas obviously they're not you know they're thousands of them coming again post pandemic and that that's great but this sort of strong sense that really perhaps the patriotic thing to do is maybe stay at home and study in china as well in a very different context we might remember that a very outward oriented japan in the 70s and even 80s began to sort of as its younger people got older and there were fewer of them just to spend less time thinking about going overseas the feeling that your career wouldn't progress if you took time overseas and internationalized and staying in the Japanese company was was more important to do well there's something of a sense that these days that if you want to rise up in China in the party spending time abroad spending time actually internationalizing and becoming more cosmopolitan isn't helpful in that particular direction of, uh, of of travel. And overall, I think that's gonna be damaging for China, but also for the rest of us as well. So what does that mean then, I think, in terms of, uh, I suppose, government to government interaction? I mean, we've had, um, we've got some turbulent times in the UK, hopefully stabilizing soon, um, but in terms of political leadership, of course we had um, Prime Minister, or former Prime Minister, uh, soon to be uh, Liz Truss, um, who, you know, sent very strong signals around Taiwan, uh, then backtracked, um, but of course, very strong signals around China as well, um, the potential to name China a threat, of course, and we will, I think, we'll see if the integrated review review still goes on um, under the new government. Um, but in that respect, there was, a, I think, an anticipation that more generally the climate in the UK around how it views China is becoming more skeptical more negative. Um, how 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 do we send the right signals to Beijing 
I think one of the things that's very important on both sides is, as I think your question indicates, Phil, uh, that there should be channels of discussion. I mean, quite what will happen in the UK, I mean, you know, I think many people on this this call will literally awesome. know that we are at the moment today, you know, in, in an hour and a half, we may or may not have a new prime minister. And if we don't, then it will probably be within a week, but it won't be very, very long. And then we'll see what that person does, you know, who their foreign secretary is and, and what the direction of travel is mm. on, on China. In the wider sense, I think it is fair to say that the channels of communication between the liberal world and China have really become very thin in recent years. And a variety of things have come together to make that the case. Uh, on the Western side, well, on the global side, there's obviously COVID, which has prevented one-to-one -one, um, uh, interactions. And that, I think, you know, again, the lack of those diplomatic interactions shows just how important they they are historically speaking we all know that you know zoom is fine as we see at the moment but it's not the medium on which you can actually have you know in-depth discussions on, on anything very much um so that's there on the western side i think particularly during you know the presidency of, of donald trump i would say there seemed to be a lack of willingness, partly for reasons of, of politics, to spend too much time thinking about where there could be channels open to China, but also it's just much more difficult for that sort of um, ecology of think tankers and policy makers and policy influencers in China, many of whom have Western educations and you know know um, the US and Canada and Europe and, and other places very well, to actually be out and about having those sorts of interactions. Um, now, I remember actually, you know, pre-pandemic under the Trump administration, some of those people found that their multiple entry visas to the US were being you know cut off, which struck me as a deeply counterproductive sort of move in terms of the kind of interlocutors who you want to have going between the two sides. But I would lay a small bet that even if, uh, you know, the, the, the visa restrictions on the US side have been uh, uh, loosened, which I think they, they have recently, um, the capacity of those people to get visas to actually travel out of China to go and, uh, and, uh, and interact is just much more limited. And what we also know is that the major form in which a lot of these dialogues take place now, which is very large, very formal delegations going and basically speaking in kind of open, uh, open uh, discussion uh, in front of an audience, leads to highly performative actions that certainly signal where any one domestic government thinks that its position will be the UK on China threats, the US on uh, in Anchorage, China, you know, almost uh, Shangri-La dialogue recently. What that actually does for anyone to have a conversation that means anything, I think is very unclear. Uh, Shangri-La again may have been slightly different on the grounds. It was one of the it was one of the first kind of post-COVID gatherings in that context of people in private rooms as well. But it doesn't appear, at least on the the Western to China side, that there are huge numbers of such dialogue. Certainly compared to what there was half a generation ago, there are signs, hopeful ones, that a few of them are beginning to revive. But I think it's important that they there should be active effort made on both sides to make sure that those channels open in significant numbers and that the conversations that take place actually take place a long way away from recorders and media and all those sorts of things to make it clear where bottom lines and red lines actually lie. Mm -hmm. I think those misunderstandings or those inability to read the other side are rapidly turning into one of the most serious problems in terms of uh, containing potential crises around the region. And, and maybe just in terms of the region and how China, um, is uh yeah. is behaving we've of course seen um you know some push into the south pacific with um attempts at um some more wider regional engagement by china and there's been a few questions in in the comments as well in the q a box around mm. this i mean what do you think over the next five years um at least in the short medium term what are chinese ambitions really i mean obviously very difficult communications with uh the west uh, if, if we want to mm. use that term mm. Mm. um but how does China engage with the global South? Do we see that as a strength for China or is it likewise also encountering some problems there? Mm. I would say that it's in a quite ambiguous position. So there's no doubt that the global South, you know, it's a huge category, but let's say the parts that are geographically quite different, uh, distant from China, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and so forth, still continue to see advantages in terms of good relationship with China, which allows both a massive market for products, you know, soybeans, whatever, um, but also um, for the provision still of cheap and effective technology. And I'm thinking of Argentina taking up 5G, for instance. Um, also, to add a level, I think, of, of nuance to that, which is important, um, 
the capacity to create competition. So, for instance, um, I mean, before it decided to sort of plunge into an absolutely horrific civil war, Ethiopia was upgrading a whole variety of domestic systems and it developed a metro light rail in Addis Ababa. Chinese essentially paid for that. High speed rail, um, uh, Chinese paid for it again. But when it came to mobile phone systems, if I remember correctly, it was actually an American linked consortium that won the bid against a Chinese one. And the Chinese weren't really pleased with that. But that actually struck me as a very good example of how emerging economies and Ethiopia before the war was running about 11% growth a year, which made China in the 90s look quite, quite slow. Um, to be able to say, look, actually, what, the reason we like China being around is not because we love China necessarily, but because it then means that we have a range of actors from whom we can seek to actually get the best deal for us, which is a perfectly natural thing for any government to, to want to do. So I don't think that role is absent um, in Chinese terms. The difference is that we were saying earlier in the conversation that a lot of China's investment in those areas is, is shifting quite fast from basically large blobs of money coming from not very transparent Parent development banks to private sector um, uh, provision, which actually is more subject to certain types of market rigor within the context of, uh, of China. Beyond that, I think that the immediate region, the Asia Pacific region, um, is um, it is different because it's the neighbors. And in that context, I think it's fair to say that an awful lot of actors in the region are beginning to become quite nervous about whether they're getting caught uh, between a China that clearly does have very strong desires to essentially be um, the major power in the region and the continuing but fraying issue of how far the U.S. security, uh, you know, assurances and I was going to say guarantee, but of course, they're not guarantees in most cases. Uh, Japan, yes, but South Korea to some extent, but not elsewhere. But the, the assurances of security in the region can actually be relied on. And that's why, of course, one of the regions where there's the most attention on the Taiwan question is indeed in Southeast Asia, because, of course, the question of how far US power can and will be used beyond actual treaty obligations, which is a relatively limited number of cases, and how much it relates to a kind of wider sense that America carries the uh, responsibility for broad security in the region against uh, you know, emergent powers that have their own uh, security agendas. Uh, that is the sort of great unresolved question that I think that in practice, lots of capitals in the region want the answer to, but realize it's very much a kind of question in flux. And one final question, as I see that we are running out of time. I mean, looking ahead, looking at, I suppose, Xi Jinping uh, as the leader of China, um, no clear succession, um, you know, uh, in this uh, 20th Party Congress. Um, do you think that, that we're looking at a, a more longer term um, China being led by, uh, Xi, by, by Xi Jinping, or, or do you expect that um, somehow over the next five years this might change um, one way or another? But um, you know, is, this, is this something that we need to keep in mind in terms of policymaking, in terms of being an observer of China? The one thing that being a historian of China teaches you is that there's no such thing as a straight line in Chinese history. And if you start in the year 1900, there is, I think, no way that you would have predicted what would have happened by the year 2000 in terms of China's history. Or if you did, you'd be very, very smart. I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it. So, you know, you can never say never. That said, you know, we do start from where we are. I think that it's likely that Xi's intention and of those around him is to stay as a leadership group on top for at least one more term, but probably beyond that too. Um, I think that there are a whole variety of things. I mean, we, you know, we could look at the Taiwan issue we have done, but also the wider question of getting China to that next stage of economic development. Now, whether or not the policies being implemented are actually going to do that is another question. But I think the intention is certainly real, and that's not something that will be done in just five years. So I think if you look at the question another way, which is how does Xi Jinping get to his aim of the great rejuvenation of China? And is it something that will be done by the year uh, 2027? I think the latter, we could say the answer is almost certainly no. And if that's the case, then I would imagine that he would want to seek ways to continue the project. And that means a further extension of his term. Rana, thank you so very much for uh, your very insightful uh, comments. Lots and lots of, to, to think about, of course. Uh, and this is certainly not the last time that we'll have you on um, to, to debate some of these questions. Um, 
thank you to our audience for joining us today. And thank you to Ron specifically for joining us at such an early hour in the United States as well. Um, our next uh, webinar, our final webinar of um, this year will take place um, in mid-November. Um, we will have the details up shortly, but it will be a, a fantastic event. And we hope that you could join us for that as well. But from now, from me, thank you so much for, for your attention and for your thoughtful questions. And